Hello everyone. On behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network, our national webinar on the future of septic system in rural coastal areas considering the options. My name is Kristen Crew from the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. Before we begin, we're going to go over a few logistics and then we can get started. During the webinar today, everyone will be kept on mute to ensure audio quality. If you have a question, please type it into the GoToWebinar question dialog box anytime throughout the session. We will be saving your questions for a facilitated Q&A session at the end of the presentation. After the webinar, you will receive a follow-up email that includes a link to the recording and other information that you may need. You can also download the slides from today in the handouts tab in your GoToWebinar control panel. This webinar has not been submitted for pre-approval of continuing education credits, but eligible attendees will receive a certificate of attendance for their personal record. To receive a certificate for this session, you must attend for the entire session and register and attend individually using your real name and unique email address. Certificates will be sent via email within 30 days of the webinar date. If you have questions or need assistance, please contact smallsystems at syr.edu. Now for a little bit about us. The Environmental Finance Center Network provides training and technical assistance to small waste water and wastewater systems in all U.S. states and territories throughout our building technical, managerial, and finance capacity programs. If your community or utility needs assistance with drinking water or wastewater system management, please feel free to contact us through our request form, which I will be sharing shortly in the chat. And on that note, we can get started. I would like to introduce our first presenter for today, Stephanie Dalkey, Program Manager water resource, of the Water Resources and Climate Adaptation Program at the University of Maryland Environmental Finance Center. Okay, can everyone see my screen okay? Yeah. Great. So hello, um, thank you Kristen and Syracuse for hosting this webinar. Um, my name is Stephanie Dalkey with the University of Maryland Environmental Finance Center, and I'm just going to set us up really quickly and so we can dig in with our speakers to hear more. So we're going to go over a really quick background uh, about septic systems to make sure everyone's on the same page. We'll talk, we'll hear from Molly about the impact of climate change on septic systems and what kind of problems and solutions they are evaluating in coastal Virginia. And then we'll move into hearing about projects to eliminate septic systems and transition to sewer in coastal Delaware and Georgia. And then we'll have a few minutes for questions and answers at the end. So uh, the presenters that we all will be hearing from include uh, myself, Molly Mitchell from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, Mayor Bob Wood from Slaughter Beach, Delaware, and Hans Medlars and John Ashman from Sussex County, Delaware. First, we've got a couple of short poll questions so everyone can get a sense of who's attending the webinar. So Kristen, if you're able to launch the questions. First question is, which EPA region or regions do you work in? Region one or two? three or four, five or six, seven or eight, or region nine or 10. And get your answers in. I'm gonna give you just a couple more seconds and then I'm closing the poll. All right. It looks like 26% uh, from region one or two, 36% from three or four, 10% uh, from region five or six, 8% from seven or eight, and 19% from nine or 10.
All right, Stephanie, poll is closed. You can go on. Okay, did we have our other poll question or are we gonna skip it? Yeah, sorry about that. I'll launch that one right now as well. Okay. And which sector or group do you represent work-wise? Utilities, local, state, federal government, or tribal nation or entity, private or consulting, academic, nonprofit, or other? And you can go ahead and type it into the chat. And go ahead and get your answers in. I'll be closing that poll. All right, 65% are from local, state, federal government, or a tribal nation or entity. And then 19% from private and consulting, 10% from utilities, 12% from academic or nonprofit, and 2% from other. Great, thanks everyone, and thanks Kristen. So I thought that would be interesting for everyone to get a sense of the spread of attendees. So moving on, I'm just gonna set this up really briefly. Um, so most people have heard of septic systems. They're also called on-site or decentralized wastewater treatment systems. They're typically located on private property and are a common way of treating wastewater in rural areas where it's too costly and logistically difficult to connect everyone to sewer systems. Typically, state or local governments have regulations about where these systems can be installed because they do need to have the right kind of site conditions and soil conditions to accommodate the system safely. And then it's up to the property owners and managers to uh, take on the periodic maintenance. And then these systems do have a lifespan and will need to be replaced ultimately. And as many people have heard of, you know, failing systems uh, can become a problem in some areas. They can cause contamination and public health concerns for well water or nearby water bodies. And they can also be a source of nutrient pollution that can lead to algae and other uh, aquatic life issues downstream but if they're periodically maintained, they can perform well. Um, so the focus of this webinar is gonna be talking about, well, what happens when these site conditions are changing? Um, the permits might be uh, designed for what we know about the site today. And if an area is subject to more frequent flooding today or in the future than it was when the system was first installed, what does that mean for the functionality of the system and for the, the people that need these systems to be functioning and performing well. So we're gonna hear from speakers who are kind of dealing with this in a few different ways and looking into different options so that we can be more adaptive in the future to deal with these changing conditions that may make septic systems more challenging in some places than others. So we are going to move on now to Molly and we'll switch over to her slides. Molly from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Thank you, Molly. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, is that visible? I can't see it. We see a OneDrive uh, error message in front of your slides. Okay. Let's see if we can fix that. Better? There, that looks perfect. Great. Um, okay. So we are talking um, about the impacts of climate change on septic systems. And um, just a second, I'm trying to see if I can make everything smaller because I can't see my own slides while I'm talking. Um, okay. So um, how climate change is impacting our existing systems, this is work we've been doing with the Virginia Department of Health um, to understand the issue, first of all, the scope and scale of the issue, and then to start thinking about solutions. 
So just to start off with, I want to show you why this is a concern in Virginia, but this is certainly not unique for um, septic for localities on the coastal plain. So the dark green lines on this map show the existing sewer lines. Um, and there are some expansions under consideration, but you know the existing sewer lines actually cover a relatively small portion of the coastline on which people live. So all of the rest of the coastline is serviced by septic systems. The big challenges we have, and again, this is actually not unusual, is that we don't know the actual total number of septic systems in the coastal zone, although we are working on trying to um, go through old paper records and that kind of thing to discover it. Um, within a particular plat, a piece of property, we don't know the location of the septic system. So depending on the size of that piece of property, it's hard for us to evaluate the risk sometimes to a particular property. Um, and then most importantly, the functional state of most of these septic systems is not known. So we know when a septic system fails and someone puts in a permit to repair it. Um, but otherwise, we don't know really how well it's aging. So these are the challenges that we are dealing with and trying to get our hands around the scope of the issue. Um, so just a little, you know, background on why we're concerned about this. So failing septic systems um, contribute as much as 6% of the total nitrogen load from the Chesapeake Bay watershed, which is huge. And there are a lot of contributors of total nitrogen. So 6% is actually fairly significant in that um, consideration. In small systems, though, the impact can be much, much higher. And this is particularly true in um, creeks that have very slow flushing rates, so where the water spends a lot of time in the creek before it gets flushed out. Um, so when you have that happen, you get this buildup of the contaminants, the nitrogen, phosphorus, bacteria, um, viruses, that kind of thing. And then this impacts our um, aquaculture industry in particular, because there's a lot of aquaculture in Virginia in these small creek systems. It can also contaminate groundwater. And so when you have a um, shallow water well system that is near a failing septic system, that's an area of concern also. Okay, so what's the problem with coastal septic systems? Um, so septic systems, we have our house, the fluent goes down to a tank, and then it goes from there to a drain field. Um, but that's only the beginning of the treatment, actually. The treatment is finished as the effluent moves through the sediment um, down to the water table. So in order for this to work, you need unsaturated sediment that kind of draws the effluent down through it. Um, in Virginia, we kind of rule of thumb is that you want at least three feet of separation between the surface of the ground to the groundwater table in order for a drain field to function properly. Um, and you also need sediment that, that is perks. Um, but when this happens, then you get actual treatment of the affluent before it enters the water. Um, but with sea level rise, sea level is pushing up those groundwater tables in these coastal areas. And so what you have then is you have a drain field that when it was installed, there was a three foot separation between the surface and the groundwater table, but that no longer is the case. Okay, so this is a place where we would not install a drain field anymore, um, but we have lots of them installed that are, you know, legacies. So then we don't get the treatment that we need and you can have bacteria, viruses, nitrogen um, exported to the adjacent waterways. Okay, so there are several things that we need to know. Um, so we're trying to get our hand around um, what areas might have high septic failures, how these could be related to rising water tables, because in the areas with rising water tables, that's where we expect to see more emerging problems. And then the last question is, what are the solutions to these issues? Um, and are these solutions robust to climate change. So we know sea levels continuing to rise. So we need solutions that don't just put off the problem for another year or two. Um, one of the other challenges is that I said, we know when a septic system has failed and someone comes in for a permit to repair it. Um, but there are a lot of reasons that septic systems can fail. 
So they can fail because people are not maintaining them. Um, they're parking on their septic field. They've planted trees on their septic field. Um, so that is the, the human aspect. Um, that's really hard to measure. There are no proxies um, that there are records of that you can measure. Um, but human predictability is low. So we don't expect to see patterns of failure related to poor maintenance, okay? Um, the other two are ones where you actually will see patterns. So structural, so the age of the system says so just aging out. So it's designed to last 20 to 40 years, depending on the location and the type of system. Um, we frequently don't know the ages of the actual systems or the type of system, but um, if we see a area where there's a lot of failures and we know that the basic age of the houses is, you know, they were built in the 1960s or something, then we can assume that there may be structural issues that are there. The other one is the geologic. So that's the high water table that I was just talking about and low soil permeability. Um, and these can be high water tables. This can be sea level rising. When it's in inland areas, it can be high water tables due to seasonal precipitation. And so it may be that there are certain times of the year when the area is not suitable for septic systems and other times when it's more suitable. Okay, so I said there's some predictable and some not predictable. So we can't really predict where humans are going to do poor maintenance of their system and where there's gonna be failures. But again, we don't expect those to be the primary cause of um, impacts to coastal systems. So what we're looking for is uh, patterns. We're looking for areas where you get unusually high numbers of septic failures. So in this um, diagram, the idea is, you know, you have a cluster here. And what you can do is actually take a geospatial analysis and say, is this cluster here more have more failures in it than we would expect looking at the surrounding areas okay and then if it does that's what we would call a hot spot of failures so this is an area where we have more failures than we would expect to see based on the surrounding patterns so we did this with data from bdh's um underlying from the bdh's repair permit database we used nine years of data and we did what's called the temporal hotspot. So it looked through all nine years and at the trends. Um, and we got a um, map that looks like this. This is available on our website, Adapt VA. Um, and what you can see is all of these little squares, all the colored squares indicate an area where there is a hotspot of septic failure. Um, and there are different reasons, and I'm just going to show you those in a minute. But the, the point is that uh, there are a lot of them. Some of them are in the coastal areas. Um, some of them are more inland. Um, we don't know from this the underlying cause. So we don't know if it's high water tables or if it is structural aging out issues. From an environmental perspective, it doesn't really matter if they're failing. They're contributing things to the environment that we are concerned about. Um, so I'm gonna show you another analysis a little bit later to get at that question of areas where we expect high groundwater tables to start to cause problems. Okay, so these are the hotspots. So each of these dots actually indicates a pattern over the nine year period. So for example, this one with the little box in the middle, the dark box in the middle, the lighter pink box is an intensifying hotspot. And so what that means is then the first year of the analysis uh, maybe it was a hot spot, but it was only a, a few more failures than you would expect. And over time, over those nine years, we saw more and more and more failures. Um, these little dotted ones are what we call sporadic hot spots. And so that means that over the nine years, there were years when this was an unusually high concentration of failures and years when it was a less high concentration of failures. Um, so you can see we have all of these different patterns kind of around, um, you know, so this dark square here, these are persistent hotspots. Um, so these are areas where all nine years we had unusually high numbers of failures. And then in other areas, you can say, well, you know, there are some years they were high failures and other years where they weren't. So what can we learn from this data? 
Um, so our consecutive and persistent hotspots are areas where we are very concerned about them because clearly there's a continual um, failure issues there. So these are areas that would really be key targets for installing sewer systems um, if you can get the sewer system out there. Um, they're also key targets for continuous monitoring of the adjacent water bodies so that we can see if there are water quality issues um, that are coming out of those. Um, we do see some intensifying hotspots. So these are ones that were not, did not have an unusual number of failures at the beginning of the nine years, but by the end had a very high number. Um, so these are ones where we're particularly concerned that we have rising groundwater levels and that this is um, pushing it towards more failure. We didn't have a ton of those, though. That's only about 3% of all the hotspots. And then the sporadic hotspots are likely due to years of high water tables. They may be more related to precipitation change than sea level rise, but they can be sea level rise related. Um, so like these ones here are actually located right adjacent to a coast, uh, a little creek you can't see under there. Um, so they're probably related to high um, water levels from the, from the tides. Okay, so that's our current issue. So looking forward, what can we say? Um, so this is, you remember I said that we we're looking for a three foot separation from the surface, the ground surface to the water table. So this is a model of looking at ground elevation above the water table. So these dark blue areas are areas where we currently believe that the water table is less than three feet. Um, below the surface. So these are areas that would not, at this point, are probably already not suitable for septic systems. The pink dots indicate address points with septic systems. Um, so you can see we do have some houses that are in areas where we are concerned the septic systems may already not be functional. The medium blue is areas where in 2040 we won't have the separation we want. Um, and so you can see we have more address points in there. And then the light blue are areas where by 2080, we expect that they will, um, the groundwater table will be too close for septic systems to function properly. So what you can start to see here is there are places where we see um, emerging concerns where we say, okay, these are areas where we probably don't wanna put in new septic systems. Um, we're concerned about the ones that are already there. It also highlights areas where um, sea level rise is not a particular concern. So if we get failures over in these areas, we might be more concerned about aging infrastructure. Okay, so what are solutions? Um, so there's no like one solution, unfortunately. Like I said, we are putting um, sewer lines out in some areas, but they tend to run in you know straight lines along roads. And so that misses a lot of the parcels. It just would be really expensive to get out a lot of these waterfront parcels. We have lots of these nooks and crannies in Virginia, little tidal creeks. Um, so elevated systems and mound systems are very popular solutions to these issues. They um, have kind of two concerns. Um, one is that the mound systems in particular are just buying you a little bit of time, right? Sea levels coming up on the coast, so the the sea, you know, the mound is so much, right, maybe a half foot above the current ground level, and, you know, that's only buying you a small amount of time. Um, the other concern is that the, like, elevated systems, they're expensive, require maintenance, um, so they aren't necessarily a great solution for everywhere. Um, the other solutions that have been proposed are using community systems, and this map is showing results of an analysis we did where we found clusters of houses near each other that could maybe all be treated by a single community system. And then the green and purple blobs are indicating adjacent lands that are suitable for septic systems. So we think that these, the, the dots indicate houses where we think the septic systems are of concern right now. And these would be areas where you might put a community system where you'd have longer um, resilience to sea level rise issues. And then the other one, which hasn't gotten as much attention, but is something that in these low-lying areas probably needs consideration, 
are reclamation and reuse systems. So these are self-contained units um, that are compact and treat um, the sewage um, and also they can be placed in places where they're less likely to be impacted by flooding. Okay, so again, I wanna say a caution is that the data we're using is really collected for regulatory permitting process, not this type of analysis. However, there are, um, that's kind of a general issue uh, throughout the coastal plain that we, we don't have good data collected for these types of analyses. Um, so that leads us to a lot of unknowns, right? Where our septic systems are, how many are at risk, what type of systems they are. Um, but this is the type of analysis where we can use to get our hands around how big of an issue we might be dealing with. Um, and then the two kind of takeaways from this is, uh, this is obviously an important issue to address, but building resilience in this topic was going to be expensive and it's going to be difficult. It's not going to be a fast fix and it's probably not a single fix. Um, it's probably going to have to be a suite of adaptation options. The other takeaway is that preventing future issues is probably an important key. So as we move into permitting new properties and new septic systems and that type of thing, we want to think about what the future conditions are going to be. And I'm happy to take questions. I also, I put my email at the top of that slide. It's molly at bems.edu. So if you think of a question, you know, tomorrow and you really want to address it, please feel free to email me. Molly, we have one question. Um, for community system, for community systems, who owns the systems? Is it the town, LLC, or district? Yeah, so that's a great question and it's actually one of the challenges. Um, so it depends on the size of the community system. So there are towns that have big big community systems that are essentially small wastewater treatment plants um, and that those are owned by the town. Um, but this can also be implemented on a sort of an HOA scale. Um, there is a lot of concern though that community systems so you have individuals who own these septic systems now and a community system does have to be maintained and has to be kind of overseen by some sort of entity and there are some concerns about how exactly you go about making the switch from these individually owned systems to having people engaged in um, community systems Great, and then I have another question. What is a safe distance from one treatment system from another? Um, that's a really good question because it depends a lot on uh, the conditions of you know, the groundwater, how fast it's flowing, what the connectedness is, how deep the groundwater is. Um, so I don't know that there's a hard rule um, about that. We try to keep septic systems more than 100 feet from anything else um, in Virginia, but I, I don't know that there's a number, a single number that works in every situation. Also for the community system, um, are you proposing a STEP or a STEG system? So I have not gone into the details of the systems because um, there is actually a lot to think about there. Um, one of the problems um, with the community systems is also uh, because of our elevations in Virginia being like the coastal parts very low and you're so these areas you're going to are higher they require um, pumps grinder pumps and that kind of thing they can be really expensive in in design so that's the next step it's to figure out where you might want to put them and then the next step would be to figure out what the design would be that would work most effectively in that situation and then what the cost of that would be um, before we know if they're good solutions for particular areas. Okay, great. I'm gonna ask one more question and then we're gonna move on um, and we'll, we'll save the rest of the questions for the end. Um, Do you suspect that a large number of coastal systems are failing due to old age or is rising sea level 
more of an apparent reason? Yeah, that's a really good question. My guess is it is a strong combination of both of those. Um, we do in Virginia have a lot of old communities that are near the waterways. Um, and so it's probably both that systems are aging out and that you have high groundwater um, coming in that's, that's driving the issues. Perfect. All right, Stephanie, I'm going to switch back over to you. Thank you so much, Molly, for that interesting presentation. So next, we are going to hear from Mayor Bob Wood from the town of Slaughter Beach, Delaware. He's going to share about their experience. And then we have Hans Medlars, the county engineer for Sussex County, Delaware and John Ashman, the Director of Utility Planning, and they're going to go into some details from sort of an engineering and logistical perspective about what is involved in choosing to connect a community to an actual larger sewer system. So if everybody can see my slide, I'll hand it over to Bob and then Hans and John. All right, well that's, that's a pretty good picture here. That looks really romantic. But um, anyway, um, a lot of the things that I would we're going to say today, you kind of already covered them, but let me do it from more from a perspective of a small town. Slaughter Beach is a fairly small town. We have about 250 full-time residents um, during the winter. During the summer, the town grows quite a bit because we're kind of a, um, you know, it's right that we're right up the road from Rehoboth Beach and Ocean City, Maryland, and the the, the much larger resort uh, areas. Um, so you certainly failing, failing systems are an issue, um, and those that aren't failing are old, and eventually they all fail. The, the cost of a system, it, probably $15,000 is the minimum that you're going to get a system, and it's, that's maybe made for a two or a, you know, bedroom house. It's not going to have a lot of people in it, so it, it goes up to 30 or even more. Another thing that really concerns me here is pollution um with when these systems are being used daily as you come up Slaughter beach you're basically talking one road that goes through town on one side is the delaware bay on the other side is a pretty pristine marshland and i'm not sure exactly what goes on here but the less pollution we could have in both of these entities the better um an example of how just little things can really affect pollution um we're part of the largest area where horseshoe crabs come in and they come in and lay their eggs and horseshoe crabs really aren't the issue but a lot of shorebirds come in right after that uh, looking for those eggs as they migrate up the coast it could be red knots or willets or sandpipers and uh, they're here to eat and balk themselves up the red knots start in terra del Fugue, they come all the way up to south america and they come here and when they come here they're half their body weight they started with so they're going to leave here and go to the Arctic and do their nesting, but they need to put on a lot of weight and they use horseshoe crabs in order to do it. Well, while they're here, they're eating and they're pooping. And we see a difference in the water quality. And just that little thing can make a big difference. Um, other than now replacing it with sewer system. A couple of really... Um, things that we really think will be really great with this is one i think eventually no matter what we did the federal government's going to come in and say no more of this septic business you got to go to a sewer system and right now through hans and the county we're able to do it a little bit more on our terms i would hate for them to come and say you have to do it now and it costs what it costs so you know hans has come come in with kind of like a uh, a knight on a shining horse and said hey i think we can make this work right now so that is really going to be a great thing he was also able to through the um order infrastructure advisory council cut our costs down quite a bit they're going to forgive about half of the cost of the system to the town and made it a lot easier for me to sell it to the town um sanitary part of it when it does flood here we have a bunch of old systems I know some of them just get totally flooded out. Of course, you know, whatever's in those systems goes out into the local area. And, um, you know, obviously that's not really good. Um, 
property values. Um, I, I think that certainly um, when you have a sewer system, your property values are going to go up a bit. But the other side of that is we have people who come in and look. Like, like for instance, I, I grew up in Baltimore City. I mean, all I ever did was flush the toilet. It went away. I don't know where it went. I didn't care. You know, here it's like, whoa, it could be, you know, every time it could be a problem you know, coming at you. Um, but a lot of people come in and as soon as they see septic, they're done. It doesn't matter what the house looks like. It doesn't matter what the deal is. They're not even interested. So it's not only your property values go up a little bit, but a lot of the lookers who are coming and we're becoming more and more gentrified and the people who are coming in or they want to build bigger houses when, on the lots. They either want to tear down a few houses and rebuild bigger houses. So that's one thing they don't even they don't even want to talk about. That just doesn't work for them. Um, and and the other part of it is just like you don't have those worries that you have with a septic system. The third part I'll touch on briefly is in a town like this, a little coastal town, you have to try to get as much infrastructure as you can because if big storms are coming. You never know when the state's going to look at you and say, I don't know that it's really worth it. So we do have our a, a, a water system here in town. We do have a little boardwalk. Now, I'm not talking about the kind with rides and French fries. It's just a little observation boardwalk. But it, it's pretty nice. We get about 10,000 visitors there a, year, there a year. We have a little park where we're doing. We have, actually have restrooms here, and we have a pavilion. It's on a state road. They're going to redo our bridge soon. So all that infrastructure counts, but the sewer infrastructure will be by far the best of all. Um, and that, that's about it. You can go over to Hans now. Thank you, Bob. And take it away, Hans and John, to get into the nitty gritty, please. <clears throat> so good, good afternoon. I'm Hans Medlars. I'm the Sussex County Engineer. Uh, John Ashburn, Director of Utility Plan. And uh, maybe I'd like to start with uh, saying that based on, uh, on accounts, residential connect connections, business connections, Sussex County is the second largest sewer utility in the state of Delaware. And that sewer utility started as a remediation utility. So we have about 80,000 accounts, half of these are remediated former on-site treatment and disposal systems. So I wanna say we are quite versed in, in the remediation of on-site systems. And uh, what's driving this in Delaware, before we go into the detail, is the promulgation of the TMDLs. You can see here sort of like a, a short list of our recent projects, because if you include all the projects we've done since the 70s, it would be a very, very long list. And uh, what we see also is most of the systems we are remediating, they date back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, most of them predate on-site system permitting. So there's no information available on the actual systems or its body. So we can also say, unless they are recently replaced after the total maximum daily loads were promulgated in the state of Delaware, they are standard systems whether that's gravity or LPPs or mount systems, but they don't have a performance standard nitrogen or phosphorus. So on the, what we call performance standard nitrogen three, which is the one which applies to on-site systems, your normal discharge, if you have an old style with no performance standard, you're going from a high 40s, 50 total nitrogen discharge to a below 20 under the PSN3. But our treatment plants discharge below five. So you can still see, even with a system which has a standard for nitrogen, you're still four to five times as much polluting nitrogen as we are as a sewer reg regulated sewer utility. So, <clears throat> so I want to speak to the cost and then John takes it to our projects. We see our costs for the remediation in the uh, 30 
40 and even beyond $40,000 per remediated system. That is sort of uh, on par with what it costs to install a high performing nitrogen system, which is in the order of 20,000. But uh, we are a petition driven utility. We cannot just go out and create these systems. So John, talk a little bit about ours before we jump back into the solid beach. So uh, on that on that last slide, actually, I wanted to point out that out of all those projects, four of those were actually large on-site septic systems that were owned and operated by the communities. Uh, they were up for permit, not going to make the you know not going to be able to make the load that they needed for the TMDL. So they've actually contacted with the county to. Uh, remove those systems as well. And they actually now will be coming to the county once they're complete. Um, we receive and compile our requests from the residents, the communities and different municipalities such as Slaughter Beach in order to go in and take some of these systems offline. Uh, this, 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 this list grows sometimes weekly <laughs> and changes quite often. Okay, now let's go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. So, so these are our elimination projects now that are either on the books or, or upcoming in different stages from funding approval, design, bid, and construction. And this is used to identify which funding agency is funding the project, um, where we are in our polling, where we are in our status of our projects. And this allows everybody to contact with the residents when they call in, you know, is there a system coming in our area or where, how close are we? And what, that's the question a lot of times is how close are we and when can you get to us? Uh, more so lately, the, the thing is the timeline. How fast can you get to us? And right now we're probably running between a three and five year backlog. Uh, so if something comes in today, they may not see sewer from us for five years. And we are, we're spending between 100 and 150 million dollars a day in capital. So this is about as fast as we can get capital projects out there. And about as fast as we can get funding applied for. Uh, once once they're submitted, um, it takes a while to get that funding application ready to go. And by the time we're done one, we're moving to the next one. And sometimes there's two, three, four at a time going. Want to go to the next slide, please? So when we're talking about sea level, you know, we are very aware of these sea level rises because a lot of the county infrastructure is below elevation three. So the last few systems we have been designing were either uh, what we call small diameter, which are grinder pumps and small diameter force main, or now we're, we're switching over to vacuum systems because we can we can uh, control the elevation of the either grinder pump pit or the vacuum pit, we can flood proof them and we can raise the lids up to what we believe is a 2050 flood elevation above and beyond what we have today. So uh, that was the reason we went to a vacuum system design. Slaughter Beach was an overall $22 million project. It's fully funded by the state revolving fund with about 50% of loan forgiveness or grant in order to make it affordable based on median household income. There's about 300 connections out there in Slaughter Beach. Like the mayor said, uh, 250 full-time residents. But if you look at the actual uh, improved structures, we have 300. So uh, uh, can we go to the next slide? <clears throat> So you can see the challenge is uh, you see Slaughter Beach up there on the on the top, and uh, you can see the extent of the pressure main required to bring us down to the treatment plant, and uh, that is it's a cost. Both both of these are cost drivers. It's an expensive system to install, and also quite a ways to go. Now, um, you want me to talk about the steps that we want to talk about? Still, you can. So this is a unique extension step for us because our utility is regulated by the state code. Everything goes under Title IX. And uh, so we can install these systems based on Title IX, 
And if we are dealing with a <clears throat> incorporated municipal entity, which Slaughter Beach is, we can actually take the route that the town does all the heavy lifting, and the town council goes through the public processes and establishes, based on their charter, the vote necessary to ask and request county council establish a sewer district area. And in this particular case, the town resolution was passed, the town resolution was presented to county council, and then we made, we, the engineering department, approach county council to extend the sewer district boundary. But for us, that's the easy part because we don't have to go through the uh, establishment of a, of a referendum based extension. We can do this strictly based on the town's resolution. So thank you very much to the town council to establish that and uh, made our lives a little bit easier. But it also allowed us to accelerate the timeline because we could establish the district faster and apply for the funding and get the binding commitment letter for the loan. So that all is in John's, uh, in John's world and he's taken us through there on breakneck speed on this particular one. And uh, within nine months, pretty much, yeah. yeah. Within nine months, we had the money in hand and design started. So this project actually from the town resolution to final construction, we, we could get this done in three years plus, which is for today's world, pretty, pretty impressive. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this gives you the detailed timeline, essentially what I already covered. It's sort of a, it gives you the exact date, it gives you exact steps, how we approached the funding agency and what we did to see here. When we uh, saw a beach vote, August of 21, and the uh, council, uh, we have the money in hand a uh, little bit over a year, a little bit over a year. So, uh, we also have to do obviously the engineering reports. We do all this in Habits John, it's the master of the engineering reports and the environmental assessments. But uh, again, with that in hand and the project done, project design is well underway. We have all the base surveys done, and uh, we are we are looking at probably a construction start this year. Next slide, please. So there was a there was a question about some of the abilities and what things we can do to try to get through some hurdles and some problems with the septic elimination in some of our water projects. And this is some of the stuff we're seeing here is land values, one of the big ones. Uh, land along the coast is very expensive. Uh, trying to get easements, trying to get pump station facilities, vacuum facilities, uh, anything needed for upgrades. Uh, it, it's become quite costly to try to purchase that land. Uh, one of the newer things now is material costs and availability. Let me go back to the land values. Okay, sorry. Because uh, under, in any project, we, we need a number of easements and fee simple acquisitions. I would say a certain percentage of the people we approach are not cooperating for the reason we can only pay appraised value under the state law. So any given project, we are probably enacting eminent domain in about 5% of the acquisitions. And you can imagine that slows us down, slows us down quite a bit, but uh, the Delaware courts are very much, the, the law is very solid and within, you know, within months of filing, we have access. But to get us to filing the suit is actually time consuming. So whenever this happens, it adds about three to six months to the process. Uh, so far, in this Water Beach Pass project, we are lucky. We have good cooperation, and uh, so far we have not run into any issues. Back to you, John. You know, we've actually ran into some projects where uh, the land was absolutely not obtainable. We had to change our design because they will not give us an eminent domain if there's a second option. 
Uh, whether that second option is more expensive or not is irrelevant. But uh, if there's a second option, they won't give us that. So we've completely changed our design on some of those. And uh, the other one I was talking about is material costs. We're finding long lead times on pump station components, uh, lack of material, certain size pipes they're unable to obtain. And uh, that's, that's costing time and money as well. Um, another one is some of the, the NEPA Act. Uh, assessing. Yeah, let me go back a little bit. The latest funding we have, like the Slow Beach funding, requires full compliance with the Buy American, Build American, Buy American, and uh, this this becomes very challenging in certain piece, certain infrastructure components we use. So that also drives the price up and definitely delays project constructions. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, back on the NEPAC, uh, assessing impacts on some of the already disturbed areas where we're going into existing subdivisions that have already, the roads have already been cut, the parcels have already been dug up, but we're still needing to go in and do some additional assessments. And some of these hit historical and cultural affair requirements, which trigger our phase ones and phase two archaeological investigations. These all cost money, they all slow down the progress. Um, and our projects, you know, get hampered. It takes them longer to get in there. Uh, gives us, you know, the costs just keep going up. So the longer we wait, the higher the project cost goes. When you go into the implementation phase, and it is first the design phase, we we are having extreme difficulties to get cooperation, especially from the non-power cable companies, to get. Uh, as build information for the design. So by having that lack of information, we, it tr triggers many times differing site condition change order requests, slowdown, uh, standby charges by contractors. And it, it's over the last 10 years, it has greatly increased with the proliferation of different uh, media companies. So before, we, we were certainly well versed dealing with the power company and the phone company. But at this point, we in our subdivisions with three and four different media company cables, and it becomes a, it literally becomes a nightmare. And uh, we, we have issues with uh, non-responding misutility locates. It's, it has become a very difficult, very difficult to, to install uh, sewer systems in a fully urbanized environment. And uh, that uh, is probably one of the biggest expense drivers we have. So I also looked at the uh, looked at the property acquisitions already, so I already covered that last call. We can move to the next slide. Uh, so we talked about the easement acquisition yeah. and some of these we find out a lot of things down here in trusts and multiple multiple owners. So tracking down all of them and getting signatures does become a problem. Um, we deal in you know minority communities, communities. We, we we deal in underserved communities where sometimes clear title is a difficulty. So you know these are all challenges we're trying to overcome. So Hans touched base on the existing infrastructure interference. Uh, the other thing we're seeing a lot of is with the wage rates required by state and federal funding. Uh, ages, these agencies with those requirements are known to increase our projects by 20 plus percent. Uh, when you're talking a $21 million project, that's, a, that's quite an increase. We have bid projects, let's say uh, side by side. Certain projects we have, we would bid with a wage rate alternate. And uh, so we certainly have good documentation what the uh, what wage rates does to to project costs, but again, it just comes down to the if you accept federal or state dollars, you have to commit to the uh, to meeting all the requirements, which drop which wage rates obviously is one of the requirements. But we do have completely county funded projects uh, in the millions. We have eight nine million dollar county funded projects exclusively. We just awarded a ten and a half million dollar project in our in the base uh, treatment plant, and we have several other projects 
we designed the county just uh, last year floated a 100 million dollar county bond for that reason and we have a substantial collection of monies in our sewer connection charges so we have we're very price conscious when it comes to trying to deliver the product for our customers now we do have issues as i said with the sea level rise i already touched on why we changed some of some of our designs up we have hardened some of our infrastructure with uh, flood proofing manholes uh, but we also have experienced significant salinity increases and uh, chloride increases after coastal storms which is going to get only worse and i, I want to close out one of our treatment plants the largest one 10 million gallon plant has an ocean outflow the other treatment plants are land-based they have spray irrigation system and chlorides are the enemy of spray irrigation so the future in my opinion for coastal treatment must contain NVDS pyramids and in our falls because the chlorides are not going to get any lower and uh, land-based systems just can't handle these kind of chloride levels so that puts us to our end right? i think that puts us to our end that wraps up our rich presentation right on time yes perfect thank you hans and john and also thank you bob for sharing um what it's uh your experiences have been and uh getting slaughter beach uh, on the path towards sewer connections and also some of the other considerations that the county deals with in terms of taking on uh, smaller systems. So I think that was really uh, an interesting side to everything. So before we move into a, co we have time for a few questions. I just wanted to point people to an interesting case that's kind of completely different from most situations where uh, Jekyll Island, Georgia is actually a state park managed by an authority and they've been taking on and converting some remaining septic systems to sewer so um, if you're interested, you can check out their website and they've got a, a very detailed carrying capacity assessment that they took on for the island. Um, so that kind of relates to a lot of the issues that folks have touched on here in, in terms of infrastructure capacity and future conditions in terms of not only uh, sea level rise, but people um, and human development. So I recommend you check that out. But otherwise, I think we've got a few minutes for questions and wrapping up. Um, Kristen, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. Um, so this first one, I think, will be best for Hans and John to answer. Um, do you have to meet any low or mod income requirements to qualify for funding? No, we do not have to meet that, but we do serve, as I said, a large number of uh, underserved communities. And based on the income level of the communities we get larger percentages of grant or loan forgiveness so uh, for example in a, in a low to moderate income community we will have up to 75 percent of loan forgiveness in a high in a what we call a market rate community we would get up to zero percent uh, loan forgiveness so these are the ones we really look at to do our own funding so we can uh, sort of tailor that. So we always look at the income levels. All right, and the next question is, is there consideration um, for utility management of cluster on-site systems as an option to central sewers where a connection is much more costly? Uh, the, uh, the community systems on the Delaware uh, regulation would have to meet at a maximum a PSN2, which is a 10 part per million standard. So if an HRA were, if a community were to opt to install a system in lieu of the unregulated existing individual on sites, that is possible. But I do not recall in the entire state of Delaware that ever happening. Do you know? No. So it's possible, but it has not been has not been used. 
All right. And the next question, are you aware of any mobile home communities with private decentralized systems that have received funding? Uh, the, the same is true. The, the, we, we, we do have the option, but the, as I said, no mobile home community has yet taken us up on that. Hmm? Yeah, but I mean, we're actually doing one mobile home community right now, but they're going on county and central sewer, not on community sewer. All right. And on site? Right Go ahead. At the Inland Bays, there is a mobile home community, which is called uh, West Bay, a few hundred units. They have a performance standard to 10 part per million total nitrogen system, they operate. But the, that was built as a community system from the get-go. That was not transitioned over from a individual to a uh, community system. All right, and the next question, has on-site incineration of the septic waste been looked at? Uh, I've heard about it, but we never looked at it, no. How much of this problem can be attributed to ground subsidence as opposed to mean sea level rise? That is uh, interesting that is asked because we were just partnering with the Lewis Board of Public Works on a long range planning study for our common wastewater treatment needs. And the consultants actually pierced out the two components, the subsidence versus the uh, sea level rise. And the subsidence is about 10%, a little bit less than 10% versus the 90 plus percent on sea level rise. So in the uh, in the case, we were looking at 2.4 total, two, and the target was 2050. So the, the breakdown was just over 90 on the sea level. The sea level rise is the, is the 800 pound gorilla, the uh, coastal zone, the coastal zones of Delaware experience a by 10% component due to subsidence. And, I and didn't this know, question, have advanced treatment systems like Adventech been considered for systems with high water tables? That would be a question for the Department of Natural Resources because they actually permit the on-site systems. So, the, it's un, unlike to most other, uh, like unlike Maryland, I should say, the county counties in Delaware are not involved in on-site system permit. Does the county see aerobic septic system being installed with spray or drip disposal? Uh, drip disposal. All right, and. Last question, I think this might be for you, Stephanie. There was a figure at the beginning that depicted a septic system and the location of the soil, it said wastewater treatment in the soil. And this person was curious if that was just the soil itself or if there's an additive that is used to treat the discharge. Yeah, I'm afraid I can't answer that very well. The graphic was uh, taken from the, the US EPA's website about septic systems. So I would recommend checking that out for more detail. All right, great, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Stephanie, Molly, Hans, John, and Mayor Wood for sharing their expertise with us today. Following this webinar, you will receive a follow-up email with the slides from today and a link to the recording. We also ask that you complete the webinar evaluation following the webinar, so you can let us know what your thoughts on today's session, as this helps us plan for future webinars on topics that are important to you. Thanks again. I hope that we see you at future EFCN events. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Thank you Kristen. Thanks, everyone.